Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 2,323. Today I'm talking with a very talented race car driver. He drove for McLaren and Ferrari in Formula One. He's driven endurance race cars, been involved in the racing scene for decades. But today we're going to learn the other side, the creative side, because he's quite the artist. Be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah! Today I'm in Santa Monica, California, with a very special guest by the name of Stefan Johansson. Stefan, welcome to Cars Yeah! Do you have any gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? I am indeed. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. You've released many clutches in your time, and I think a lot of our listeners today are going to go, whoa... Uh, XF1 racer, endurance racer. This is going to be all about racing, but we're going to take them down a little different path today because of what you're doing with your life. But before I introduce you and we go down that track, what's one little thing that maybe people don't know about you, Stefan? Well, I mean, I mean, some people may not know that I've, in parallel to my racing, I've I've been doing a lot of art. I've always been an artist since since uh, well, actually, since about my sort of mid late twenties. And uh, and now nowadays that's what I do more or less. Well, I wouldn't say full time because I'm still involved in racing a lot. But a lot of a lot of my time is taken up by the art now. I love it. Well, that's what brought us together today. And I'll tell our listeners, I had the pleasure of meeting Stefan way back in 2007. I was a guest of a good friend of mine, Duncan Dayton, in Highcroft Racing. We were at the Miller Motorsport Park, and I got to meet you and watch you race. And uh, it was such a fun time for me uh, to see what you guys were doing in the, the Le Mans series. Let me give you an introduction, and we'll explain a little more to our listeners of why we're here talking to a racer about artwork. Stefan, Stefan Johansson spent most of his life racing cars with a 10-year career in Formula One, driving for Ferrari and McLaren Formula One. He won the prestigious Le Mans 24-hour race for Porsche, my favorite mark, and spent over 30 years racing at the highest level of motorsports. In parallel, Stefan has always had a strong interest in art and design. And when his close friend, a driving colleague, Elio De Angelis, was killed in a racing accident in 1986, he decided to pick up a canvas and a brush and paint something in his honor. And 34 years later, his art and life has evolved into a new reality. And today he spends the same time and focus on perfecting the craft of being an artist as he did when he was professionally racing. We'll be back in just a moment. But first, a word from our sponsor. So give them a little love. Buckle up. We're here with Stefan Johansson talking about art and racing and a whole lot more. We'll be right back. Years ago, when it was time to renew my collector car insurance policy, my carrier's rates went up, way up. But my usage was the same and I never made a claim. I didn't even have a ticket. So what's with that? So I turned to American Collectors Insurance. Has your collector car insurance recently raised your rates for no good reason? Tired of paying an annual membership fee? Then it's time to look around and call American Collectors Insurance. I shopped around, I asked friends for recommendations, and found a winner that I can trust. And boy, I'm glad I did. I saved hundreds of dollars every year and slept better at night knowing my baby was properly insured. American Collectors Insurance have been protecting vehicles since 1976. They provided me with an agreed value insurance policy backed by their history of taking great care of their clients. What could be better than that? So give them a call and ask for a quote today. 866-ACI-YEAH. That's 866-224-9324. And protect the ones you love like I did with American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. Did you know that Cars Yeah! is in the top 1% of all podcasts based on listenership according to Libsyn? the premier RSS feed for podcasts in the United States. That's right. And Cars Yeah! is the only five-day-a-week automotive-focused podcast for you to get your message into the ears of thousands of listeners daily from all over the world. Plus, DuPont Registry recommended Cars Yeah! is one of their top 10 car podcasts for you to enjoy. Cars Yeah! has experienced tremendous growth, plus your ads are evergreen, meaning they never go away. 
and more and more listeners find Cars Yeah every day for their daily dose of automotive inspiration. Do you want to expose your brand to a highly targeted list of automotive enthusiasts in a very unique and very personal way? Well, I can help you. Contact me, Mark Green, at mark at carsyeah.com or through the website at carsyeah.com today to learn more. For several years now, you've heard me talk about Linkage Magazine. I've been a subscriber since the start. Their talented and creative team brings you a spectacular publication and website that shares the automotive passion from a worldwide perspective. Linkage is about driving, restoring, collecting, and firsthand experience at collector car auctions and more. They bring you real-world values plus rational, experienced opinions on the current markets. They cover the automotive world and the people who share our passions. And Linkage Magazine has grown, mailing you six issues annually. Join me on this journey with Linkage. They're geared for the automotive life. You can subscribe at LinkageMag.com. So, Stefan, we are back. Now, before we get into the art that you're doing today, can you share with our listeners a little bit of your background in racing? Because, my gosh, decades on the track, running for some amazing teams, all sorts of driving. What first you got you into racing? Uh, well, my dad raced sort of club racing back in Sweden, so I, I grew up with it. Uh, just started going right to races with him when I was three or four years old. I uh, got my first go-kart when I was eight, and uh, you couldn't start racing until you were 12 back then. But uh, as soon as I was legal age to race, I uh, started racing go-karts. And, and then, you know, the natural progression, really, like most drivers today, Formula Ford, Formula 3, Formula 2, and then Formula 1. I got lucky enough to make it into F1 and uh, spent 10 years doing that. And I and, uh, did some odd sports car races in parallel but um and then i went to america to do indycar uh five years and uh and then spent probably another 10 to 15 years racing sports cars so uh, yeah i've done pretty much everything except nascar my goodness i mean what a career what a life but today we're going to be talking about what you're doing today because this is near and dear to my heart i grew up in a household where my father was an artist he was an architect a sculptor art was a big part of my life i've had hundreds of artists on the show and when i rediscovered what you're doing in art i went whoa this is pretty cool so (laughs) let's kind of start with the artwork when that began and you said in your 20s what inspired you to pick up doing artwork was it just something so different from racing yeah so my grandfather was an artist so i sort of grew up i remember uh, you know quite clearly even today when i was real little i used to stand next to him when he was painting you know and remember i used to love the smell of the oil paint (laughs) you know and then sort of watch him he was sort of an impressionist painter and uh so i guess i had a that's probably where my interest started i'm guessing and uh i have really no inclination or even thought about doing it myself during my whole youth didn't do any art classes or anything in school uh but when i started making some money in racing i started buying some art here and there collecting a little bit uh you know traveling around the world and in, in formula one and so on but it wasn't really until as you mentioned earlier my uh, very close friend elio de angelis who was racing for lotus together with Ayrton senna and then with brabham um, and I was with Ferrari at the time. We we became really, really close friends and spent a lot of time together and traveling together and so on. And when he had his he had a horrible testing accident and, and got killed. Um and I was there trying to help him out of the car, you know, on, when he was on fire and everything. Yeah, it was a really traumatic experience. You know, it's the first time I really lost a close friend in, in racing too. So and for whatever reason, I don't really know even today, but prompted me. But uh, anyway, I went and bought some canvas and some paint and brushes and i wanted to just do something in, in his memory you know and uh and i realized almost immediately that this is something i really love doing you know it was a very sort of therapeutic calming and you know just engaged a whole different sort of set of senses in me that i didn't realize i had before you know so so i've been doing it on and off ever since really and that was in like i said in 1986 This is really fascinating to me, and as I mentioned earlier, my father was very much an artist, and one of the things he did in later life was he started a group called Living Through Art, and he taught people who were terminally ill 
how to create things with art, painting, drawing, and sculpture. Mm. And the entire idea of it was to get their focus off their terminal illness and focus on something that was creative and inspiring. And it left something behind for their family members to remember them by. And your story reminds me very much of what my dad was a part of. And, And artwork can be very therapeutic. So as you evolved your styles in art and what you were doing, was that a big part of why you kept doing it? Because you just went, oh, this is so good for me, for just my inner soul. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's certainly the reason I think it was one of the main reasons, you know, when I started painting that very early on, I never showed anyone what I did really for a very, very long time. Uh, It's only the last sort of seven, eight years, I've I've started showing some of my work, you know, and uh, I did it purely for my own, you know, like I said, a lot of it just there, it was just very therapeutic, you know, between races, but it was also, uh, you know, you, you kind of get into the same state of mind as you do when you race the car. It's when, when when you're on the limit and everything flows in a race car, it's a very kind of meditative uh, state of mind you're in you know every it, it's just very calm everything it's almost like in slow motion everything it sounds crazy but it you know when you're really really on top of it that's kind of what it feels like you know you're so in control of everything and you know all your senses are on full alert and it's kind of gets to the same state in with painting but it takes me a, a lot lot longer <laughs> <laughs> than it did with racing because you know racing i've done in my whole life so i i get dialed in you know in three three to five laps you're kind of in the space you need to be you know to get the job done uh whereas with the painting it's still even to this day you know it takes a little while to to get the flow going you know sometimes it works sometimes it's it's a real grind you know but uh right but that's also part of the process well i think so my dad always said when it came to art is it's like seat time he used to say seat time in a race car you have to just keep doing it and keep practicing Mm. and evolving yeah. And I want to uh, tie this nice segue into the styles, the various styles that you paint in. One of them is pointillism, mm-hmm. which when I first saw some of your artwork, I went, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. I studied a lot of art history. I was a graphic designer and advertising executive in my career uh, early on. And so I really got into artwork. What got you into that style? That probably wasn't where you started, I'm guessing, because it's very sophisticated. But what got you into pointillism? Well, that's that's very that's the most recent style, you know. And everybody so, sort of when people started to sort of see what I was doing, uh, you know, everybody said, well, "Why don't you paint cars?" You know, and I felt like, well, <laughs> yeah. it feels a little bit too close to home, you know. I've mm-hmm. spent my whole life driving cars, you know. I maybe you know I want to try to do with my art something different. But then I sort of it, it's always in the back of my mind, you know, because I wanted to do. There are thousands of unbelievably talented artists that paint beautiful paintings of cars and I I just didn't want to be one another one of them you know because there's so I wanted something that is my style you know something that's unique to me and this was always kind of you know I guess if you're an artist you know you always try to find that sort of something that someone can immediately recognize it's your work Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's one of the difficult parts actually of being being an artist to, to find that unique style that's yours and that people also like of course I mean so, and it was really just over, well, maybe two years ago now, a year and a half ago, at Nice Airport on my way to London, and I picked up this book I found at the airport on um, on Sorat and Pissarro, and, you know, oh, the, yeah. the sort of impressionist period and the pointillism. And because uh, I was always kind of fascinated by that anyway, so I just wanted to, and then it sort of just clicked, you know, so, well, what if I incorporate that into... You know, something really modern, like a, you know, uh, and really tech- technical, like a, you know, racing car. And so that's what I did. So I started experimenting a little bit and, and sort of found found a style that I think works, you know, because I'm trying to project the sort of the intensity and the chaos and the feeling of speed as well, you know, with, with this uh, with the, with this pointillism style. So and people seem to like it. I mean, I get quite a lot of orders on these paintings now, actually. Well, I think it's great. Yeah, it has a lot of movement and action to it, which when you think of the, the older style artists doing pointillism, they didn't really have that. It was more still type things. And you've yeah. evolved it into this this fast, almost galactic type racing through space type uh, imagery, which I think is beautiful. But you also have involved gotten yourself involved in 
abstract art as well. So it looks like you've explored a lot of different styles. Yeah, so I really have three unique styles that I still work on all three, actually. So the the abstracts, they're also tied to racing. So I'm trying to get you know, project the feeling of speed and every painting is inspired by different corners or sections of, on Grand Prix circuits around the world. And I name each painting after these corners and then I write a little story around it, what inspired me, you know, what, what triggered the idea of the colors and so on. So that, that series I call Memories of a Past Life. And then uh, and then I got the portraits, of course, which is very, very figurative, very detailed, sort of more, I guess you can call it fine art or whatever, quite large scale. Uh, and those are based mostly around the text, in fact. So find different quotes or, or sayings from various people, and that kind of then triggers something that oh, this would be a really great painting, you know. So, But it's really really the words that are more meaningful than the actual subject itself. Is that your Friends, Heroes, and Wankers series? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what I call Friends, Heroes. I think art is subjective, but I think it's pretty obvious as soon as... <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. It's, it's when I looked at that, I went, "What is going on here?" And then I went, "Oh, this is so cool!" And for you listeners, I'll put links. Of course, it's easy to find uh, Stefan's website, but uh, he's having some. I mean, you're you're having some fun here in a lot of different ways. And the other thing I find interesting is you're also become very commercial because you transpired some of this into everything from gift cards to home goods, a hats, bags, skateboards. I mean, you've really evolved this into a very successful commercial endeavor. Bravo to you. Yes. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's tough, obviously, to break break into the art world for, for any artist, I think, you know, and especially if I'm not exactly at the sort of a ripe young age to... <laughs> <laughs> I sort of needed to fast forward my art career a little bit, you know, and I figured if I do the the merchandise and promote the art through the merch as well. So that's what I'm doing. And I, and I think I'm gaining, getting some traction through that also. But, all, you know, I also enjoy creating these products. Uh, get an idea. And in fact, this, this abstract art lent itself. That was never the intent when I started doing it, but it actually lends itself incredibly well to various products, you know, because it's, it's just, a, the, it becomes decorative, you know, like on my jackets or the bomber jackets, I use the art as the lining, you know, and the, and then yeah. the hats and all these various products. Yeah. So there'll be a whole range. I'm just sort of starting now. There's going to be a whole range of cool things coming out here sort of in the near, near future. Well, I think it's really brilliant. And the other thing I noticed on your website, watches. Yeah. Tell me about those. Yeah. The watches I've been doing for a long time, actually, that's, I uh, started the first watch I made was in uh, 1989. Yeah, it was, and it really started with that was still when I was racing in Formula One. Swiss brand came, wanted me to do a, be an ambassador really for them, but the watch they had wasn't that great in design, I felt. So, but I, you know, I already had a strong interest in design and art. So I said, well, why don't we do a project together? And so that's how it started. And then, they were more interested in doing sort of high volume, low price, and I wanted to do some nice mechanical movements and so on. So, but I learned enough during the process to sort of understand how how the business works. So then I just went out and 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 did my own thing. Really designed a watch and found the manufacturers in Switzerland, and and uh, I'm still doing them now. So it's 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 going pretty well. Yeah, I think it's really cool. The other thing I noticed on your site, which is near and dear to me growing up in Southern California and being a surfer when I was young, is you've got some, uh, looks like limited edition surfboards. My question is, do you paint right on the board and then is it glassed over or how are they created? No, these are actually printed. Printed, uh, okay. They're, they're, again, based on original paintings. Got it. So so I only did a few just to experiment a little bit, but I am actually, I have done on the, I haven't done it on the surfboard yet, but I want to. Um, do original paint on the surfboard also, and then put the epoxy on top of it. Right. But uh, I've done it on uh, skateboards. I've done quite a few original skateboards nice. that are sold. But I also have a whole series of those skateboards that's got the original art printed on them. 
Well, I was a skateboarder yeah. too back in the day. So you're doing oh, some, great. you're doing some, oh yeah, growing up in Southern California. That's how I used to go to school lots of times from elementary school through junior high before I could start yeah. riding motorcycles and, and driving cars. So yeah. I love it. You know, I like to talk about people's, what I call are driving inspirations, mentors in their life that really were influential. Uh, now you've been around so many interesting people in a very long career, both in art and in racing. Is, is there maybe one person we could talk about today that that was a great inspiration for you, very influential? Um, I don't know if there was any one single person in particular. I mean, not certainly from a, if, if you look at the racing, but there was a lot of people that definitely steered me in the right direction and, and helped me along the way, you know, to, you know, just well-chosen words every now and then, you know, from whether they were dry, some drivers, but, Mostly just people, you know, like maybe sponsor uh, representatives and things like that, you know. So mm -hmm. you accumulate just, you know, different sort of little nuggets here and there from when you when you speak to various people, I think. When you think about your racing career and the fact that you drove so many different kinds of cars, a lot of racers don't do that. Now, some do, but most stick to one type of racing. But you branched out a lot. Was it because you were inspired by uh, the challenges that that faced? Well, I mean, first and foremost, I just love racing, you know, still do, of course, you know. So I just wanted to, there was a car available and I didn't do anything that weekend and I was free to drive. Then I would drive because, nice. you know, I just loved racing, you know, and yeah. that's but first and foremost, it wasn't anything more than the fact that I, you know, that was my passion, you know, and that's what I love doing more than anything. Challenges. Yeah. We like to talk about challenges here. Uh, racing is all about challenge. I would love for you to share maybe one situation when it comes to your art world, your creative world, that was a challenge for you. But when you look back, you go, you know, I'm kind of glad I had to go through that because it was a great learning lesson. Yeah. I mean, it, well, in the art world, it's still Every day is a challenge, you know, and I think it, it, I hope it always will be, you know, I hope I don't get stale and, and, uh, just go to the studio and, you know, and it becomes routine. I think it always has to be a challenge, you know, in some way. And I, you know, I look at a lot of artists, you know, and incredibly successful in terms of financially what they get, but to go into the studio and just do the same stuff over and over and over for 30, 40 years, it'll, it'll do my head in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet. <laughs> you know. Nice way to put it. I mean, you got to do it because you love doing it first and foremost, I think. Whatever you do in life, I think. Not, you know, in my case, it's art and racing, but it could be anything, I guess. When you look ahead at your art career, at least maybe in the short term, or it could be the long term, is are there some things that you would still like to accomplish and evolve into that you're kind of thinking about? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I would love to, and I'm, I'm started to explore a little bit, uh, you know, with sculpture as well. And I'm fascinated because, you know, now with technology we have today, I think you can do sculpture in a lot of different cool ways, you know, even, um, even with 3d printing and things like that, you know, to, uh, create some pretty cool stuff. So that's something I'm looking into doing as well, but I really need to, you know, get a little bit more established in the sort of real art world to, you know, to, to at least find representation, you know, where you can show it on a, in a more meaningful way, I guess. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I'll, I'll share with you and I'll go back to my father who evolved from drawing and painting. Of course, he was an architect in his career, but art was always a big part of his life, getting into uh, working in clay yeah. and then combining clay with different elements as well, which he really found interesting and fun and uh, was always experimenting with mixing clay with wood and metal and steel and all sorts of different things. And uh, yeah. yeah, just be careful with the kiln. Things can explode. <laughs> so <laughs> I remember, yeah. remember some of those stories. Yeah. I would love for you to talk about a special vehicle in your life and given that you've raced if you could pick at least for today one vehicle that you went this is so cool maybe it was the first f1 car you ran maybe it was an endurance car it could have even been your first car uh but just one vehicle that really stands out and share a story about that ride well i, I mean whether well, it's one but i mean i think the whole the whole period of the turbos you know especially the early years before there was any 
boost limit or anything like that were, I mean, I don't think there will ever be race cars like that again, because they were just the wildest, craziest thing you could ever drive. You know, I mean, the F1 cars back then weighed 500 kilos. Yeah. yeah. And we had, I remember with Ferrari in 85, we had over 1600 horsepower in qualifying at Monza. My gosh. You know, one lap, I mean, literally one lap, and then the engine was just rooted. It was all pouring out of every orifice, you know, but uh, one lap qualifiers. So you had one, one go and you had no idea because you had no way to practice, you know, test before. So you just, they just send you, you crawl around the whole lap, you know, to, because the tires barely made one lap wow. before there was just blisters all over them. Yeah. Uh, it was completely insane, but there was never be another, it's a thrilling and crazy experience from a race car as those were. I mean, we had, the Monza is a very long track, so the gears are very long. And we had wheel spin. And we only had five gears back then, going from fourth to fifth on on the straight. We we had wheel spin. You know, wow. it was just crazy. Yeah, oh I mean, every gear. It was absolutely insane, but incredibly exciting, of course. How do you get your head around? I'm trying to get my head around that. I mean, the first time you jumped in one of those, I mean, was you just went, what are they trying to do to me here? <laughs> I mean. Well, it's a gradual thing, of course. You know, you don't go from zero to that. So it's a, you build up to that, you know. So it's not it's not as, you know, I mean, if you if you had never driven anything and go straight into that, you probably, you know, I mean, you wouldn't make it past the first corner, you know, because it'll think the thing just lights up, you know. And then so you had to anticipate all the time, you know, because the boost back, you know, when you had that much boost, especially the lag was huge, you know. So you kind of had to hug the inside the apex as long as you could and give yourself as much room as you could on the exit because and then you floor it and then it'll took maybe a second or two before the boost kicks in but you don't know exactly when so <laughs> yeah. when it kicked it was like an explosion you know so you just needed as much space as you could on the on the exit to just and then just you know pump the gears in one off the other because the you know you literally was just bump 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 and then you were in top gear you know yeah, those those were all were those all V6s? Yeah. Well, not all of them. The the BMW was a 4 straight 4 and I think Alfa Romeo had a V8, but most of them were V6s. Wicked time. Ferrari, uh, Turbo, McLaren, yeah, they were all V6s. So fun to watch you guys back in that era. So I'm going to be a bit of a car psychologist for you today, and I think because you're such a creative guy, you could might get a little little creative on me with this one. If you were reincarnated as a vehicle, manifest, and this isn't what you want to be, Stefan. This is how you perceive yourself as a driver, as an artist, in a vehicle. So you got to dig deep into your psyche for me here. What would you be, but more importantly, why? Well, it would have to be a, a normally aspirated, manual shift, V12, very light, because that'll engage pretty much every sense in your body, I think, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and um, yeah, uh, that would probably, th- those would be the criteria, I think, yeah. That makes and, sense for a guy, a guy like you. And w- what is it about that type of vehicle that is you deep inside? Well, I think it, it, again, like I said, you know, I think it engages all the senses that gives you pleasure driving the vehicle, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, it's either that or, I mean, personally, I'm actually more, you know, something that takes me from A to B as comfortably as possible, you know, on, <laughs> on, a, on a daily daily level. But uh-huh. if you wanted something that is, you know, really, you know, then I think those those would be the criteria I'd be looking for, you know, to, to really get some pressure out of it. Sure. So now everybody who's listening is thinking, so what does Stefan drive as a daily driver? <laughs> well, I, I still do quite a lot of work with Ferrari. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used something out of there, but I'm actually got a Maserati Levant right now. Ah, okay. The SUV, yeah, which is a great car. Oh, awesome! On it, yeah, it's a uh, it's as close to a sports car as you can get from an SUV, I think. Well, some of these SUVs these it's days, a in fact, car. a lot of them are quite spectacular. Yeah, they are. I think cars in general today are incredibly impressive. I mean, you know, as you think, I mean. You can buy an SUV today with more horsepower than an F40. <laughs> and the F40, when that came out, the Ferrari was like the craziest supercar no anyone's ever heard of back in the day. 
Yes. And yeah. now, now you know, housewives drive around in, in cars that have more horsepower. <laughs> I know. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Different times. Yeah. And then you put in the, uh, and I, this begs me to ask you the question, you're, how, how do I phrase this right? Because I don't want to set you up for anything here. What's your opinion of EVs? Well, I'm mixed, mixed feelings on that, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure if electric is uh, is the final answer with what they're trying to achieve environmentally and everything else. It obviously has some benefits, but I think it also has a huge amount of drawbacks. And I think, in fact, I'm, I've been quite passionate about this in terms of what's going on in motor racing because I, I firmly believe that if they opened up the rules, in Formula One in particular, because that, that's where most of the development happens, to an open source of energy, let's say, mm-hmm. which have to me. So you're only allowed to use X amount of energy for the duration of a Grand Prix. Oh, I get uh, gotcha. But it also, needs to, it also needs to meet all the emission standard, uh, you know, can, you know with, with all the, everything that's required. And it wouldn't take more than a maximum three years for the engineers in F1 to figure out what is the actual best source of energy to propel a car. Interesting. You know what I mean? Because yeah. they, 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 they are the smartest guys on the planet, literally, and they would figure that out, you know, and, and we will have the answer, which would obviously then, uh, you know, filter down to road cars and everything else, because it'll be, you know, if you add up all these criteria and whatever, you know, whatever works best, that's what they will end up with. But now, of course, you know, we're stuck with a very rigorous set of rules that, yeah. you know, so, you know, and everybody's spending a fortune basically fudging the last 5% of something that's already been determined by some guys in an office, you know. I agree. Yeah. I'm glad you put it that way. I think that's that's a, a very unique aspect to look at it and from the racing side and how that can trickle down. And we see that in so many manufacturers having one Le Mans for Porsche. You think of Porsche and yeah. the, the cars they've come out with, like the 959, and how all that technology trickled down into the road car and worked quite well, actually. Yeah. Right? Uh, so Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that used to be the thing with, with racing, you know, that whatever they come up with on the racing would eventually bleed over into road cars. Now it's the other way around almost, you know, it's like now they're forced to use a set of, or one criteria of technology, which we don't really know. I mean, I, you know, I firmly believe that we don't really know if that is the best source of color car, you know, and if it's the best, best way to protect the environment either. I, I mean, right. you know, I think there's enough arguments either, you know, on either side of that to, to, um, you know, and I don't think anyone's got really, uh, the best answer yet. Nope. They're all working on it, but, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. If, maybe if the government got out of our way. <laughs> and let, well, let, that would certainly help. Yeah. You know? well, I mean, wouldn't I think it? Most of those guys couldn't run a lemon stand in the private sector. So go, go, there. go figure. <laughs> I like it. Very cool. You know, I love books here. We love to share books. Is there a book that you've enjoyed that you could share with us today? Oh, my goodness. There's lots of books. But the the one that I pick up and reread every sort of four or five years, I guess, is uh, The Law of Success, Napoleon Hill. Mm, Yeah. That's sort of, um, I guess that's one of the, the ones I keep coming back to, you know, but I mean, there's, there's lots of great books, of course. Yeah, that's a great one. A uh, nice one to recommend here. So before I let you go today, Stefan, I'm an enabler. I'm going to enable you to go on what I call the ultimate drive. I'm going to park anything in your driveway. You can take it anywhere, but this is the fun part of this possibility. And that is you can take anyone with you, including somebody from the past, who's no longer with us, which opens up a wide variety of different individuals that you could enjoy this drive with. So let's start with the car, and then we'll evolve into where and the person. What's the ultimate drive look like for you? Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I need to think about that one. That's, it's not an obvious one, I don't think. It's a broad question. Sometimes it's easier to start with the person or the place versus the car, because that might define it. If you want to be with somebody that you could talk with, you wouldn't want a loud, obnoxious car, right? Well, this is the thing, you know. I mean, I hate to say it, but I actually love being on my own. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a lot of people answer this that way, just to get away from everybody and yeah, go for a drive, I mean, I'm right? I'm very, you know, I actually, I'm, I'm quite happy 
I'm almost worried about myself sometimes because <laughs> I just love being doing what I do and doing my own thing, you know. Yep. So, um, w- which then would allow me to have a a little bit more noisy and not as comfortable car, possibly. But uh, okay, that's cool. Yeah, but I think you know it would probably be a Ferrari of some some sort because there is something magical to these cars. Yes, there's. It's just hard to pinpoint what it is, but it's just the whole. And obviously, you know, having spent so much time with them, so you know, during, over the years yep. when I drove there and everything, you know, there's there's a lot of great memories there. You know, that would certainly, um, yeah, play a big part of that too. Is there a place in the world that you'd love to just jump in whatever cool Ferrari you could pick and just go for a drive? You've been all over the world so many times. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's some incredible drives all over the world, really. You know, in different uh, different areas, so, of course. But um, if they close the roads, it's a different story because I'm not a huge fan, frankly, of driving on public roads, you know, especially not driving fast because you just don't know, you know, what, what's around the corner. It may not be something that affects me, but, you know, God forbid, you know, there's a little kid running around or something, you know, so I try to avoid that, you know. But, yeah, I mean, there's some amazing, I mean, like the Stelvio Pass, in Italy, obviously, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots and lots of great places. But my favorite, one of my favorites, of course, is the Nurburgring. You know, even if you go on a road car, it's an amazing place. You know, and uh, yeah, it's a, just a fantastic track. I mean, just for fun, sometimes when I do, I do some uh, work with the simulator uh, manufacturers here. I take a put them, you know, in the in the sim. I put the modern F1 car on the Nurburgring. Ooh. And that is about as exciting as it can get. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. That place is crazy. I've been there twice. I've only been able to do it in rental cars, uh, much to the chagrin of the rental car companies, probably why they don't let yeah. you do that anymore. Exactly. But, uh, but if you tell them you're going there, they won't even rent it. No, car no, no. I, yeah, you there. never say that. This was yeah. long before they started yeah. forbidding that. They figured it out. <laughs> I think it was after I yeah. returned a, an E-Class Mercedes with no brakes left on it, but yeah. I won't say I did that. But uh, yeah, that, that place is insane. So uh, there you go. Well, yeah. nothing like a Ferrari at the Nürburgring. I love it. You have taken us on a wonderful trip today, and I can't thank you enough for spending some time with us. Before I let you go, could you share maybe some words of inspiration for our listeners out there, or maybe even uh, guidance for somebody who would love to try some art, but maybe thinks they can't? Well, I certainly didn't know if I could either. You know, I've never had any lessons or anything. I just taught myself, and I think it's just, you know, just keep at it. Like anything you do in life, you know, you just got to keep at it. And, you know, eventually it'll just click, you know. And and if you think, you know, A, if you're passionate about what you're doing, it always works out in the end. My my three key words in life is integrity, passion, focus. For me, that works, you know. If, if you stick to those three principles, you know, I think things will sort of eventually fall into place. You just never give up, you know, never give up. I have to smile here with you, Stefan, because I've interviewed hundreds of race car drivers, and I was wondering when those words were going to come out of your mouth, because literally, I probably interviewed over 400. Never give up is always mentioned by every race car driver. And I was going, are we going to get through this without him saying those words? And there you go. You (laughs) you delivered them on a platter for me. (laughs) Well, I think we've all been through it. Motor racing is 95% frustration and 5% elation. And you just got to get through. But thankfully, those 5% by far makes up for all the frustration, you know. So, and that's what you deal with, you know. I mean, it's only one guy who can have the the best car on the day, you know. And he generally ends up on the top of the podium. So, you just got to keep 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 at it, you know. And eventually, things will fall into place. Absolutely. But I love those three words, integrity, passion, focus. So, we'll leave you listeners with that today. Something that applies to every aspect of life, whether it be racing, your career, your relationships, friendships, lovers, whatever it might be. Integrity, passion, and focus. I love it. How can people learn more about you and see your artwork? Well, my website's probably the best place. It's just my name, stefanjohansson.com, or Instagram. Uh, I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Although 
it's a battle sometimes, yeah. but uh, yeah, to to post some of my content on there as well. But uh, most of, most of the stuff is on my website. Otherwise, yeah. there you go. I'll put links to uh, Stefan's website, Instagram. He has a Facebook page as well. You can go and check it out. But mostly, go check out his artwork. I think you'll be very very excited with what you see. And there's all sorts of things for all different levels of people of uh, purchasing things as well. So go check it out, Stefan. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Taking a little pit stop is good to see you again it's been far too long since i got to see your smiling face in person but i'm so excited with what you're doing and, and so happy to share it with the cars yeah listeners until you and i talk again my friend i'll see you down the road thank you my pleasure thank you for having me absolutely this has been great fun here at cars yeah it's all about inspiration and our charity of choice is tech force foundation where it's all about making a positive difference in young people's lives. Tech Force helps young adults discover their talents and passions for all things automotive, with a mission of helping students develop a career as a professional technician. Tech Force awards nearly $2 million in scholarships every year for students to pursue technical education, and they support hands-on activities, events, and mentorships across the country, working to change the outdated perceptions of these careers. Autotechs are in high demand, but the supply of qualified technicians is critically short. They need your help to fuel their mission. Learn more and join me in supporting them at techforce.org. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah! Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah! Yeah!